All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome back. All right. So um, I hope this week goes well for you, whatever that may mean. <laughs> I'll try not to say too much about the elections. All right. So anyway, um, today is Wednesday, November 4th, day 23. All right. Uh, and we're going to finish the, uh, we're basically going to finish up with confidence intervals, right? Interval estimates. Uh, we're going to do interval estimates for P, sigma, and sigma squared today. All right. Uh, and then uh, next Tuesday, we're going to finish up part four. Uh, remember, part four goes from lessons 24 through 32. Actually, in theory, literally in theory, I could have put lesson 32 over, over here, but you can see that based on the timing, it really makes sense for lesson 32 before, to be before the Thanksgiving break. Um, and basically, it's an introduction to the ideas of hypothesis testing. So you can kind of mull over those ideas. Well, not too much, but you have the opportunity to think about these ideas during the break. Uh, this homework is due uh, the Friday uh, November 19th, right before the Thanksgiving break. Okay, and in the meantime, I will be working on homeworks two and three. All right. Okay, hopefully all the distractions are gone, I hope. <laughs> okay, and uh, oh, now, um, uh, by the way, next Wednesday, seven days from now, there is the Veterans Day holiday. So uh, that's to honor our veterans, and also we will not be having class that day. All right, um, and we're going to finish up with Lesson 32 next Monday, did I say Tuesday? Monday, next Monday, that finishes part four, all right? And then our homework session is the week before Thanksgiving week, all right? And then this final sprint for homework five, very dense, very packed in. So make sure that you're nice and you get a nice break there because we're going to work hard right around here. Harder. <laughs> any questions before we go on? Any questions? Feel free to put any questions in chat, all right? This is a nice break from the elections, remember? <laughs> any questions? All right, so let's go ahead and start with lesson 30. We're doing 30 and 31 today. Okay, day 23. Hi, everyone. Let's continue with confidence intervals. Before, in lesson 28, we used the Z distribution to estimate a population mean mu in the case that sigma was presumed known, although this was the rare case. If anything, lesson 28 was more useful in preparing us for lesson 29, where we used t distributions in the case where sigma was presumed unknown. So you might be wondering, well, what's the point of using the z distribution when doing confidence intervals? Actually, the z distribution, the standard normal distribution, may be more useful in lesson 30, where we're going to do point estimates and, more importantly here, confidence interval estimates for P, which is a population, proportion, or probability. We're going to use the standard normal Z distribution to develop confidence intervals, one minus alpha confidence intervals, CIs, for P, a population, proportion, or probability. So this is a great lesson for politicians who care about polls and proportions of voters and what politician doesn't care about that, or Maybe you have friends who are gamblers or magicians and they care about probabilities. Either way, this lesson can be very handy. Again, in this lesson, we will find one minus alpha confidence intervals. The most common confidence level is 95% or 0.95. Although there are others, uh, for example, some other popular ones are 90% or 0.90 and 99% or 0.99. I can ask you about a variety of different confidence levels. But the gold standard is 95% or 0.95. In fact, when you hear about polls uh, on, in news reports or from the news media, uh, the normally assumed confidence level is 95% or 0.95. And statisticians are really irritated by the fact that news organizations don't report that fact, that the assumed confidence level is 95%. Uh, news organizations tend to report the margin of error, E, for their polls, but they usually don't report the fact that the confidence level is assumed to be 95% or 0.95. Statisticians think that that should be reported. In lesson 30, we're going to find 1 minus alpha confidence intervals, CIs, for P, a population proportion, like if you're a politician who cares about polls, and they all do, or probabilities, where uh, you might be a gambler or a magician. Okay, so let's do a simple example of a probability. Let's say that your friend is 
David Copperfield, the magician, and he gives you a coin. Well, first David washes his hands, right? And then he gives you a coin. So you get a magician's coin. And you might be wondering what about this coin, aside from whether it's clean or not. Uh, you might be wondering whether or not it's a fair coin, whether it really is a 50-50 coin. The probability of heads is 0.5, and the probability of tails is 0.5. The coin is fair. Now, granted, as we saw in that Vsauce video, in real life, coins are not perfectly fair. But let's assume that in an ideal world, most coins are fair. And we're wondering if this magician's coin is biased some way. So what is the parameter of interest here? The parameter of interest is little p which is the probability that this magician's coin comes up heads on a flip. So it's a probability, it's a success probability. Let's say that a head is a success. But on the other hand, there's the complementary probability, Q. Q is the failure probability. Q is 1 minus P, is the complement. It's the probability that this coin comes up tails on a flip. So we have a binomial experiment here involving this magician's coin where a success is a head and a failure is a tail. Q and P are complementary probabilities. They add up to one. So is the coin fair? Is it 0.5 for P, 0.5 for Q? Is it biased? Is it 0.8 for P and 0.2 for Q, or maybe vice versa? Well, let's estimate these probabilities. And to estimate these probabilities, we're going to use a sample proportion. Because you can also think of these probabilities as proportions. Uh, in principle, imagine a coin being flipped infinitely many times. Uh, what proportion of the flips will come up heads? For a fair coin, it should be about one half by the law of large numbers. So we can also, we can often frame problems as either probability questions or proportion questions. Okay, so the sample proportion, p hat, is obtained by x over n, where x is the number of successes, the number of heads we get when we flip the coin, okay. and n is the number of trials, the number of flips. The number of flips or trials. So for example, let's say that you take David's coin, and you flip it a hundred times. You take David's magician's coin and you flip the coin a hundred times. So, so n, the number of trials, you could say the sample size is a hundred flips. And let's say that we actually see 60 heads. We flip the coin a hundred times and we see 60 heads. A head is a success, that's the thing we're counting. X equals 60 heads. Well then, what would be the sample proportion of heads in our sample when we flip the coin 100 times? Well, p hat, p hat here, the sample proportion of heads would be x over n, 60 heads over 100 flips. Or 0 0.6, or 60% which makes sense. If we flip the coin a bunch of times and 60% of the flips turned up heads, it makes sense that we take as our sample proportion 60% or 0.6. So what is the sample proportion of tails? Again, we can think of p hat up here. We can think of p hat as the sample success probability or proportion. We can think of Q here uh, Q hat. as the sample failure probability or proportion. 
how do we get Q hat? Q hat is one minus B hat. It's the complement. So the complement here would be would be one minus the point six or point four. So if the success if the sample success probability p hat is 0.6, then the sample failure probability q hat is going to be 0.4. So based on our sample, it's a 60/40 coin. We got 60% heads, 40% tails in our 100 flips. So overall, based on our sample data, these are these are our best point estimates for p and q. P hat is 0.6, q hat is 0.4. And again, these are our best estimates for p and q, which is the true success probability and failure probability in a way from the overall population. If you imagine the coin being flipped infinitely many times. So let's say that capital X is the number of heads that we get when we flip this coin n times. In this case, n was 100. Now, before we actually flip the coin, x is a random variable. I'll write that out. Okay, down here. Before we flip the coin, x is a random variable. We don't know yet what value we're going to get, for sure, because we can't predict the future. However, although we can't predict the future, we can find, in principle, a probability distribution for x if we knew what p was, right? So before we flip the coin, x is a random variable. Uh, we don't know its value yet, but we do know that x has a probability distribution. And before, in lesson 23, we knew what that distribution was because we knew we had a binomial distribution, right? This is a binomial experiment when we're flipping coins and counting heads. Uh, we have a fixed number of trials, say 100 flips. And before, in lesson 23, uh, uh, we assumed that we knew that the coin was fair or that the probability of heads was, say, 0.6. But here's the problem now. Now, the problem is that we don't know what P is. See, back in lesson 23, uh, I basically let you assume that P was 0.5 in the event of a fair coin or that P was 0.6 or 0.7 or whatever. But the problem now is that we don't know what P is. So in fact, here's the idea. See, before we knew what P was, in lesson 23, before, we knew what P was, okay? And then we would describe the distribution for X. We would describe this. We would describe distribution of x. So we get some handle on what we think x could be. What could be the, uh, the number of heads we actually get? But now we're going to do something different. Now we're going to flip the coin a bunch of times, right? We're going to flip the coin a bunch of times and we're going to get values for x, the number of heads, and also the corresponding statistic, p hat, okay. uh, which is the sample probability of heads, successes. Okay, p hat was this guy over here. And from this information, from actually flipping the coin and getting sample results, from all, from all of this, we're going to try to estimate P. So we're kind of going in reverse. Before, we assumed we knew what P was. For a fair coin, P is 0.5. And then we would basically try to describe what's going to happen in our sample. Uh, what will be the number of heads that we get? We can describe the distribution as a binomial distribution. But now we're going to do the reverse. 
we're going to start by actually flipping the coin, getting a value for x, the number of heads, and also p hat, the sample proportion or probability of heads. And from this information, we're going to try to infer and estimate the true value for p, the true probability of heads. This is inference. Before, it was straight up probability. But now, this is inference. We're trying to infer something about the actual parameter of interest, p. OK, so we want to know what this is. We're trying to estimate p. That's our ultimate goal here. We're trying to estimate p. p hat here is our point estimate. p hat here is our point estimate for p, as we've mentioned before. And q hat is our point estimate for q, the failure probability. OK, uh, but now in this lesson, we're going to also talk about an interval estimate for p, a confidence interval. OK, now remember that uh, when we consider the number of heads, it has a binomial distribution. Before we flip the coin, x has a binomial distribution. So what about uh, the methods we're going to use in this lesson? Well, we're going to rely on the normal approximation to the binomial distribution. Because remember, uh, the binomial distribution, it involved that wacky formula, right? Uh, and it was kind of hard to manage. Uh, you potentially had all these probabilities to add up. Uh, but with a normal approximation, we're able to uh, make the analysis a lot cleaner. Now, under what conditions could we apply uh, the normal approximation? If NP was at least five, and if NQ was at least five, But wait a minute, we don't know what P and Q are yet. So instead, uh, we're going to use P hat instead of P, the sample proportion or probability instead of P, and Q hat, the sample failure probability or proportion instead of Q. So to verify that we can use the normal approximation, we're going to show that NP hat is at least five and NQ hat is at least five. It turns out, as I'll discuss later on, uh, NP hat is just the number of successes, the number of heads, and Q hat is the number of failures, the number of tails. So it's easy to count. So for example, uh, if we get these sample results here, if we get 60 heads and 100 flips, then NP hat right off the bat will be 60 based on our sample results. And uh, the number of tails would be 40. 60 heads and 40 tails. Notice that both of these are way above five. They're both way above five, which means that a normal approximation would be a very appropriate. And we are not going to apply continuity corrections. You can be thankful for that. No continuity corrections. Although in principle, they can make things better. Okay, next up, we're going to get to business. What formulas do we use to find confidence intervals? for P, next time. Right, we're dealing with inference. We're trying to estimate P. That's what all these uh, uh, networks are trying to do, right? Uh, what proportion of the vote is Biden getting or what, what proportion is Trump getting in this state, Arizona, Nevada, Pennsylvania? <laughs> Inferring P, we're seeing that all the time. In a way, I'm reminding you of election week. Questions? <laughs> all right, sorry. <laughs> Hi everyone, we are now going to construct 1 minus alpha confidence intervals, CIs, for P, a population proportion or probability. Uh, for example, little p could be the probability that a coin, like a magician's coin, comes up heads. Basically, the probability of heads for the coin, the true probability of heads based on physics. Here, I'm going to discuss the anatomy of these formulas for these confidence intervals. And this anatomy should be somewhat familiar from lessons 28 and 29, when we were estimating mu and doing confidence intervals for mu, a population mean. And then later on, I'll discuss the theory behind this. And if you don't understand the theory, don't freak out about that. If you understand the examples later on, that should be sufficient. But try to get as much of the theory as you can, so you can get a feel for why these things look the way they do. But again, don't freak out about the theory. 
But first off, let's look at the general anatomy for these things, and this should be familiar. A 1 minus alpha confidence interval, CI, for P, is given by this. And this looks very natural. Because this here is saying that our confidence interval for P is going to be centered at our point estimate, the sample success probability, P hat. Just as uh, when we had a confidence interval for mu, the confidence interval was always centered at x bar, the sample mean. So once again, like for a population mean, for P, a population proportion or probability, the center of any confidence interval will be at P hat, the point estimate, the sample proportion or probability of success. So that part makes sense. Also, E is the half width of this interval. So the margin of error is from here to here, and also from here to here. Uh, the limits of the confidence interval are obtained by taking p hat and then adding and then subtracting this margin of error, e. So from p hat, you add e to get the upper limit of the confidence interval, and then you take p hat and subtract e to get the lower limit of the confidence interval, just like before. Uh, before, when we did confidence intervals for mu, we would add e to get the upper limit and subtract e to get the lower limit. So, so far, this should be very familiar from what we saw in lessons 28 and 29, except that now we're doing a confidence interval for p, not mu. And in fact, if you look at the anatomy of this margin of error, even this part is familiar, right? That's a critical value. It's the positive critical value for the z-distribution, given the confidence level of interest. So again, for a 95% for a confidence interval, this will be 1.96, just like back in lesson 28. So you might even uh, remember some of these. For a 95% confidence interval, 0.95, this will be 1.96, the same as for lesson 28. But now this part here uh, is not so familiar. Okay, before, in lesson 28, we used the standard error of the mean, right? In lesson 29, we used an estimate for that. Well, here, this here represents a measure of spread as well. Uh, this here, this radical here, the square root of p hat q hat over n, this estimates the standard deviation for the distribution for p hat the sample proportion as a random variable. Now, if that seems confusing, I don't blame you. I'm going to discuss the theory behind that next. And even then, uh, get what you can. If you understand the examples later on, you should be fine. Again, we're trying to get as much theory as we can. But again, overall, the structure of this confidence interval is very similar to what we saw before when we did confidence intervals for mu. We center the confidence interval at the point estimate, in this case, p hat. And then we add and subtract a margin of error to get the limits of the confidence interval. And the margin of error is obtained by getting a critical value, a z-score in this case, times some measure of spread for the distribution of interest. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. All right, again, these formulas make sense because the confidence interval, the CI for P, is symmetric about the point estimate, P hat. The margin of error is the product of z sub half alpha, the positive critical value from the z distribution, which depends on the confidence level. So the larger the confidence level, the bigger this thing is, and the bigger the margin of error. And then this thing here, the most confusing part, uh, this thing here, which again, estimates the p hat distribution. So here's the part where, okay, get what you can, okay but don't freak out. Well, that estimates the standard so deviation. So why does this estimate the standard deviation for the p hat distribution? All right, well, what is p hat? What's going on here? All right, remember, x is the number of successes. In our coin example, x is the number of heads that we're going to get. x is the number of heads we are going to get. 
when we flip the coin. N times, where N is pre-specified. You can think of N as a sample size. But here's the thing. Before we flip the coin, X is a random variable. We don't know its value yet. X is a random variable. We don't know its value yet. But we do know its distribution. X will have this distribution. X uh, will have a distribution, a probability distribution, approximated by the following. X has a probability distribution. It was really a, a binomial distribution. Okay, it was really a, a binomial distribution. But we're going to approximate under the, uh, the conditions before. If, uh, if n p hat and n q hat are both at least five up here, if n p hat and n q hat are both at least five up here, under those conditions, okay, we're going to approximate this binomial distribution with this normal distribution. Remember, NP was the mean for the binomial distribution, so we're going to take that as the mean for the approximating normal distribution. And root NPQ was the standard deviation of the old binomial distribution. We're going to take that as the standard deviation for our normal distribution. But now wait. In the end, we're not so interested in the number of heads. We're interested in the proportion of heads. We're more interested in P hat as a random variable. P hat is the sample proportion of successes as a random variable, okay? And how do we get the sample proportion? We get X, the number of heads. We get X, which is the number of heads. And we divide that by little n, the sample size or the number of trials. Again, this can be thought of as a sample size. So for example, uh, if we eventually end up with 60 heads on 100 flips, then p hat will end up being 0.6 or 60%. But again, p hat is a random variable before we flip the coin. p hat is given by x over n. It'll be the number of heads we get over the number of flips, the number of trials. So it will have approximately this distribution. And it does work out cleanly. The mean is going to be np divided by n, which ends up being p, the true probability of heads. The standard deviation for x was root npq. It turns out we divide that by n to get the new standard deviation of root pq over n. But wait, when we construct our confidence interval, we don't know the values of p and q yet. So we approximate them by p hat and q hat. And that's why we get this radical here. I'm trying to explain why the radical looks the way it does. If you didn't get that, don't freak out. But, I, but try to get whatever theory you can from that. We're going to apply this in examples later on. And again, if you get the examples, you should be fine. Don't freak out so much about the theory here. Okay, so uh, I keep saying, don't freak out. Uh, obviously, you're going to want to see an example. Any questions before we proceed to the example? Okay, I know many of you are going, what's going on here? Okay, <laughs> maybe you'll have questions after the example. Let's go to the example. All right, folks, let's get to it. We are going to construct, in this case, a 90% confidence interval for a population proportion or probability P. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to have this Excel spreadsheet on the side so that you can see this sort of algorithmically in this spreadsheet. I'll send this out. And in fact, you could actually use this. Uh, unfortunately, there's no super easy function in Excel that will give us the margin of error cleanly and easily like before when we did confidence intervals for mu, a population mean. Oh, but I want to interject. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, I try to email you when I can, but uh, if, if, I, for, if I neglect to email you, this is already on my website. On my, on my Math 119 website, I have a variety of Excel spreadsheets, including this one. Um, also, I think I have in chat here uh, a YouTube video about uh, some of this stuff. Okay. So if, you, if you're interested in this stuff, I can also provide you with this link. All right, let's go on. But I'll send out this spreadsheet, and it will follow the directions, and this will be instructive. 
So in my Excel spreadsheet, find a one minus alpha confidence interval for P uh, where we're using Z critical values. We always will, uh, as long as the assumptions are satisfied. Now, you can use the spreadsheet to check your work, but on your homework, uh, please show work, okay? This is meant to be a check for you. And also, it'll help you out. Hopefully, this will clarify the example. If this makes things more confusing, ignore this. <laughs> All right. A magician's coin is flipped 500 times. So David gives you a coin. He washes his hands. He gives you the coin. And you're wondering, huh, I wonder if this is a fair coin. Uh, I wonder what the probability of heads is on this coin. So you take this coin and you flip it 500 times. So what is 500 in this binomial experiment? 500 is the value of n. It's the number of trials or flips is the sample size. So here in red, I indicate what you have to enter. 500 flips, n equals 500. And then these other numbers will change along the way. Now, so 500 is the value of n, is the sample size, the number of trials. Out of the 500 flips, the coin comes up heads 230 times. 230 is a value for x. It's the number of successes we observe, because a head is a success here. Now, see here, we're, we're looking at the probability that the coin comes up heads. So a head will count as success. So this here is the uh, number of successes. Uh, it's the number of heads we get in our sample. That's little x. So we're going to enter 230. Little x is 230. All right. Uh, we're going to verify, first of all, that normal approximations are appropriate in this problem. I'll indicate this in red. Verify that normal approximations are appropriate. So remember the conditions. Uh, we needed NP hat to be at least five, and we needed NQ hat to be at least five. And actually, uh, we can do that right now based on these numbers. Because it turns out that NP hat is the number of successes. NP hat is X. NP hat turns out to be X. It's 230. It's the number of heads that we get. Okay. And likewise, the number of tails, that's going to be uh, 500 minus 230. Remember, there are 500 flips. 500 minus 230 is 270. 270 is the number of tails or failures. And these are way above five. These are way above five. So this checks out. The normal approximations will be appropriate in this problem. And we can proceed. I'll go over these calculations in just a moment. But right now, uh, we can verify that normal approximations are appropriate. The number of successes or heads, in fact, is way above five. The number of failures or tails is also way above five. Again, again, I'll get to these approaches in just a moment. But this does check out, just based on these two numbers and the fact we have 270 failures or tails. Okay, find, now this is the, the long-term thing, find a 90% confidence interval, or CI, for the probability that the coin comes up heads on a flip. Uh, we're defining that to be P. I'll put that in purple. So the probability that the coin comes up heads on a flip, we're defining that to be P. It's the success probability, the true success probability. This is a population parameter. P hat here is our point estimate. It's a sample statistic. So again, little p, that is the population parameter of interest. Population parameter of interest. Put this in purple. Okay. And then we'll write the confidence interval in, uh, uh, in this case, with the lower limit and the upper limit. And also we're going to interpret the confidence interval. But that's later on. First off, let's find our key sample statistics here, especially the p hat. That's really key. But we're also going to need q hat for later. And eventually, the margin of error. And we'll do it to three decimal places. Uh, although on homework or exams, I reserve the right to ask for uh, a different number of decimal places. OK. And eventually, when we get the uh, margin of error, we're going to need these hints from the z distribution. 
And that's going to help out when we find the margin of error. Or we can use our Excel spreadsheet. All right, let's find p hat, our point estimate for p. This is our sample success probability. Well, let's use our common sense. So p hat here. Put this in brown-ish. <laughs> p hat here. That's going to be the point estimate, the sample success probability. It's our point estimate for little p, the true population parameter of interest. It's our sample success probability. Okay, well, use your common sense. What's our best guess for the true probability that this coin comes up heads based on our sample data here, our sample statistics here? Well, the coin came up heads 230 times out of 500. P hat is going to be X over N. That's a formula. Again, sample size is 500 coin flips. We have X or 230 successes or heads. The sample proportion P hat is given by X over N. 230 heads out of 500 flips, 0 0.460. So we get heads 46% of the flips. On 46% of the flips, we got heads out of the 500 flips. Let's go to our Excel spreadsheet here. Okay, well, uh, I've already input the formula. To get P hat, that's X over N. It's the D4 cell over the D5 cell. It's X over N. I've already entered the formula in. Excel verifies, yes, it's exactly 0.46. It's exactly 46%. Right. Uh, and by the way, uh, Q hat, the sample failure proportion or probability, is 1 minus P hat is the complement. 1 minus 0 0.460 is 0 0.540. So if we got 46% heads in our sample, we got 54% tails in our sample. And that's verified in our Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I put here that the Q hat is going to be 1 minus cell D6. It's the complement. So once you enter these in, these then become automatic in black. All right. Now before, I already verified that the normal approximations would be appropriate because both the number of successes, X, and the number of failures, both the number of heads and the number of tails were both way above five. So the normal approximation should be very appropriate, even if we don't use continuity corrections. Uh, but if you want to use these actual formulas, right, uh, n p hat, okay, n is 500, p hat is 0 0.460, we get back to 230. n q hat, n is 500, q hat is 0 0.540, we get 270. Uh, by the way, why is this equal to x? Well, it's just algebra. Here, p hat is x over n. If you multiply both sides by n, we get that x equals n times p hat. Right. And then to get the number of failures, uh, it's n minus x. It's the number of trials minus, minus the number of successes. Right. It's the number of trials or flips minus the number of successes or heads. That's how you get the number of tails or failures. So if you understand the number of successes and the number of failures, you didn't even need these actual formulas, but you could use these. Okay, so our process is legitimate. Well, we're going to need the margin of error. That's, that's the key thing. And unfortunately, Excel does not have a quick function for that, the way we did for confidence intervals for mu. In fact, there were two. Uh, uh, you had confidence.norm if you were using z, sigma known, and uh, confidence dot t in the case where sigma is unknown. So there are two functions. If you if you wanted the margin of error for a confidence interval for mu, a population mean, but we don't have a shorthand for x from Excel for a margin of error in this case, a confidence interval for p. So we're going to crank it out. Okay. So the margin of error is I gave you this. This was the given formula. This was one of the given formulas I gave you up here, right? Right up here. The margin of error is obtained by taking the positive critical value based on the confidence level, 
times the standard deviation for the p-hat distribution. I mentioned the theory behind that, but don't freak out about it. All right. Well, remember, we're dealing with a 90% confidence level. We wanted a 90% confidence interval, so uh, we wanted 90% confidence. And you might remember, or you know, many stat students remember, it's going to be 1.645. And that was the hint I gave you. Uh, up here, I reminded you, hey, if, you're, if you want to find a 90% confidence interval, and Z is involved, and we're doing two tails. Uh, in our confidence intervals, we're doing two-tailed confidence intervals. Uh, in theory, there are one-tailed confidence intervals, but uh, in our class, we'll only do two-tailed confidence intervals. Uh, so we have 90% in the middle. All right. Uh, it turns out that positive 1.645 and negative 1.645 are the two critical values from the Z distribution that will trap 90% in the middle in such a way that these tails are symmetric in terms of area. So that was from the hint. From the hint, you should get 1.645 here. Uh, now, how can you do this on Excel? It gets kind of complicated. <laughs> Actually, it turns out that the negative critical value is easier to find. The negative critical value turns out to be easier to find. Okay, so how is Excel going to find this? We're dealing with a Z distribution. We want 90% in the middle, all right? That means we need 10% total in the two tails, right? That's the complement, that's alpha. Alpha is 10% or 0 0.10. And it's split in halves, right? What's half alpha? What's alpha over two? Half of 10% or 0 0.10 is 5% or 0 0.05. But remember, tables and software like to look to the left it's actually easier to find this negative critical value than this positive critical value because this guy right here is going to have 5% or 0 0.05 to the left. Here's how Excel finds out that the negative critical value is negative 1.645. I'm going to put in the confidence level, 0 0.90 or just 0 0.9, right? And then right off the bat, see that's the only part you have to enter for this part because uh, my, my Excel spreadsheet here knows that alpha is 1 minus that, is the complement, so it's 10% or 0.1. Half of alpha is therefore 5% or 0 0.05. That's the left tail and also the right tail probability. We're going to focus on this left tail probability being 0 0.05. And then the negative critical value, uh, using the norm.in command, okay, it figures out what's the fifth percentile. What's the fifth percentile of the standard normal? Uh, so this norm.in command gives the gives a percentile. In this case, of the standard normal with mean zero and standard deep one, okay? And we want 5% or 0 0.05 to the left. It's, so for the left tail or cumulative probability, it's grabbing the entry from D10. Uh, let's see. Oh, it should be... Uh, no, it should be D13. I apologize. It should be D13. This over here, right. Okay, the entry from D13. That's the left tail probability half alpha. So norm.m, you take the entry from D13, this over here. Again, my spreadsheet already has that. All these entries in black are spit out automatically once you enter the entries in red over here, right? Um, so you enter the confidence level, 90% or 0.9. Use decimal. Enter it as a decimal. Then we know alpha is 0.1. Half alpha is 0 0.05. My spreadsheet spits this out. The fifth percentile of the standard normal Z is about negative 1.645. Okay, that's where we get that. In fact, uh, this is even more accurate. But then when we plug into our formula, uh, we're technically plugging in the positive critical value. So I just take the opposite of that. I take the opposite of this entry here. That's the positive critical value. All right. So 1.645 is over here. It's the positive critical value in D17. All right, to get the margin of error, you take the critical value and you multiply by the square root of uh, p hat times q hat over n. Okay, so I already input in there, okay? It's the, it's the critical value, the entry from D17 times the square root, SQRT, of p hat was in D6, q hat was in D8, divided by n, n was in D5. So I'm referring to previous cells. It's all in here, all right. And to three decimal places, it's going to be about 0 0.0367 to three decimal places, 
rounding off. Or you could use the idea you want to round up because you want to be conservative. Either way, rounding off or up, 0 0.0367, right here. That's great to check your work on homework. But on homework, please show me this. At least show me this on your homework. I want to see the work. I want to see what you're plugging in. But this Excel spreadsheet, which again, I will uh, distribute after class, this Excel spreadsheet will come in very handy. If I don't uh, send it out, please remind me. I think it's on my website. I want to point out that um, uh, I'm using 0 0.037 because uh, remember, I said three decimal places. So uh, it's, uh, three decimal places is really 0 0.037. I have that in the notes. And then to find the limits of the confidence interval, it's same old, same old. For the confidence interval, for P in this case, you take the point estimate before it was X bar, now it's P hat, okay, the 0 0.460. And then you're going to add and also subtract the margin of error E. Uh, maybe I should put, put this in brown. <laughs> okay, okay. And then the, uh, the point estimate in Purple? Huh? Is that right? I guess I could go either way. All right, I'll put the piat in purple. No, oh, well, how about a different color? How about, uh, eh, turquoise? <laughs> okay, piat, that's 0 0.460. Remember, the, the coin came up heads 46% of the time, right? 0 0.460 to three decimal places. Give or take the margin of error, which is rounded off to the same number of decimal places as piat, uh, 0 0.037. For the lower limit, you take p hat, the point estimate, you subtract the margin of error, uh, just like before, right? For mu, it was x bar plus or minus e when, you, when we were doing confidence intervals for mu. For p, we take p hat, and we add or subtract the margin of error. p hat, 0 0.460. When you subtract e, the 0 0.037, you get 0 0.423 to three decimal places. The upper limit, 0 0.460 plus 0 0.037, 0.497. So here's our 90% confidence interval. Remember, the lower limit goes to the left. The upper limit goes to the right. Do not switch these. That's wrong. So our 90% confidence interval for P goes from 0.423 to 0.497. Let's see Excel verify that. Okay. So, um, whoa, I, 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 put, I should have put a minus. Welcome here. to your hearth Oops. and home. Be quiet, Siri. Bye, Siri. Hold on. Bye, Siri. Okay. <laughs> hey, Siri. There you go. Siri was bothering us. Sorry. Right. For the lower limit, it's uh, um, it's p hat. Remember, p hat was d six. P hat was in d six over here, right? Okay. It's it's uh, p hat minus the margin of error, which is d nineteen. The upper limit is p hat plus the margin of error. There you go. The lower limit is lower. It's p hat minus the margin of error. It's about 0.423, right? 0.423. The upper limit to three decimal places, 0.497. Okay. When you round off. Although, again, um, if you just looked at these and you wanted to be conservative, remember, to be conservative, you can either round up the margin of error and then add and subtract accordingly, or here, subtract and add accordingly. Uh, or if you're just focusing on these entries here, you round out. You round down the mar you round down the lower limit, 0.423. You round up the upper limit, 0.497. So again, to be conservative, either round up the margin of error and do your minus and plus deals. Or if you're looking at this, round out. Round down the lower limit, round up the upper limit. But again, don't freak out about that. Rounding off will be fine. So as you see, uh, just by entering in the red entries here, right, once I corrected my signs here, uh, then the black entries are spit out by Excel, right, and here's your confidence interval. So you see, folks, uh, <laughs> although Excel did not have uh, functions for this stuff, hey, I'm going to send you a spreadsheet, and if you have Excel, if you enter in these red entries, then my nice Excel spreadsheet will spit out what you need. <laughs> okay, so I'm kind of doing the functions for Excel. They should pay me. Microsoft should pay me. Come on, Bill Gates. <laughs> pay me. All right. Interpretation. Okay, what does this mean? We are 90%. It's a 90% confidence level. We are 90% confident that this interval contains P. But you should say to a layperson what P is. Contains the probability that the coin comes up heads on a flip. We are 90% confident that this interval contains the probability that the coin comes up heads on a flip. So... The coin that David gave us, 
if he claims it was a fair coin, hey, my friend, this coin is fair. What do we say to David? You're a liar. Or you don't know your own coin. <laughs> You're either a liar or you don't know your own coin. Because we are 90% confident that this does not contain what value for P. What value for P corresponds to a fair coin? 0 0.5. That's for a fair coin. But this interval does not contain 0 0.5. Think about it. What does this suggest about a claim that the coin is fair? If David says, hey, my coin is fair. Well, P equals 0 0.500 for a fair coin. So the fact that this 90%, 90% is pretty high. The fact that this 90% confidence interval for P does not contain 0 0.500, it suggests that the coin is not fair. It's biased. Apparently biased towards tails action. Okay, so this is below 0.5. So based on this analysis, and we're going to use this kind of language in the last part of our course, there is sufficient evidence against the claim that the coin is fair. So if David's claiming, hey, my coin is fair, we have sufficient evidence against David's claim based on a 90% confidence level. Although if you work it out, and you can try my Excel spreadsheet for that, in fact, I can do it. It turns out a 95% confidence interval for P will contain 0.5. So under this analysis, there is insufficient evidence. Uh, we don't have strong enough evidence. We have, we have a higher and stronger burden of proof to call David a liar. So this might freak you out, and this freaks out pure mathematicians. Different confidence levels may lead us to different conclusions, okay? I mean, if we had a 100% confidence interval, that interval goes from zero to one. Well, yeah, of course P is gonna be somewhere in there, right? I mean, for 100% confident, P would be between zero and one, but then that doesn't give us any information. We have no basis to call David a liar, right? I mean, if our confidence interval is 100% and it's going from zero to one, well, there's no way that, uh, uh, that uh, I, mean, I mean, it's going from zero to one, there's no way that we're going to call David a liar, okay? Because 0.5 is obviously going to be in an interval between zero and one. For a 100% confidence interval, I know, at the, I know the interval is going to be between zero and one. I know it's going to contain 0.5. For sure, <laughs> okay? So yeah, different confidence levels uh, probably will lead you to different conclusions, right? Based on 90% confidence, we have sufficient evidence against the claim to call David a liar, right? But under 95% confidence, okay, that's not enough evidence. Um, we wouldn't have enough evidence. Uh, take a look here. Here's how, our, how my Excel spreadsheet would show that. Um, so, uh, okay, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna go over here. I'm gonna enter 0.95. Boom, here's alpha, here's half alpha, right? Negative 1.96, sound familiar, right? That's the negative critical value, 95% for Z. Here's his positive partner. Margin of error will be about 0 0.044, okay? Confidence interval from 0.416 to 0 0.504. Does this confidence interval contain 0 0.500? Yes, it does. So we're not ready to call David a liar for a 95% confidence interval. Okay. What if we did 100% confidence? Oh, it's not even gonna try. <laughs> what if we did like 0.99999? Uh, yeah, pretty wide, 35% to 57%. <laughs> I'm surprised it's not even wider, but you know. All right, <laughs> anyway. Anyway, uh, that's our key example with some interpretations and kind of theorizing. Next up, what sample size do you need in order to get a confidence interval of a certain margin of error, certain half width? Next time. They love using the Roman emperor commodus instead of confidence. Commodus was from Gladiator. Um, questions, questions. Uh, by the way, I said something imprecise earlier on. I'll put it in the corrections. Uh, I said something like, we're 95% confident that P is not 0.5. That's very imprecise, so kind of scratch that. Basically, we developed, uh, we looked at, or we looked at 90% and 95% confidence intervals for P. And then we compared the hypothesized value for P. All right, so let's be careful what we say. Questions? Questions? Hi everyone, uh, before we start determining sample sizes, and uh, I'd like to discuss some more tech. 
so for example, before, I expressed surprise that for this ridiculous confidence level, 99.9999%. I'm sorry, I should have put the captions on, I was it? Hi everyone, uh, before we start determining sample sizes, and uh, I'd like to discuss some more tech. Uh, so for example, before, I expressed surprise that for this ridiculous confidence level, 99.9999%, uh, the confidence interval for P seemed almost reasonable, from 35% to 57%, basically. Uh, nothing like zero to one. But actually, this shows how, uh, for the standard normal Z, the tails fall off very rapidly. I mean, we get about 99% within 2.58 standard deviations of the mean, and uh, we get almost everything, this proportion, within about five standard deviations of the mean. So it shouldn't surprise me that, that we didn't have to go too far out to capture almost everything. The tails fall off very rapidly for a Z. Uh, so actually, these critical values were not that ridiculous, and these limits were not that ridiculous. Although it's true that if you put a whole slew of nines after this, then eventually these would get really ridiculous. Uh, and then uh, maybe this could go negative below zero, this could go above one. Uh, in which case you would truncate the confidence interval. A 100% confidence interval for P would be from zero to one, but Excel doesn't know that. So Excel might put a negative number here and a positive number there, for a really ridiculous confidence level. I, I should have said a number greater than one. Um, you might get a positive number for sure, but uh, if, if, if your upper limit's like two or three or six, uh, you know, that doesn't make sense for P, so uh, you got to bring it down to one maybe. It works than that. So that's one comment. Uh, now what about simulation? Uh, you might look at all this and go, can't we just do computer simulations? Well, let's look at the uh, Rossman chance applets. Uh, the Rossman chance applets, uh, over here, statistical inference, one proportion inference. Now, uh, before, when we were studying binomial distributions, we would assume a fair coin, okay? Uh, let's say we flip it 500 times, right? Uh, and it turned out here that we got about 232 heads or so, uh, and we can redo this in terms of proportions. Uh, so that would be about 46, 47% uh, out of the 500 flips. Well, let's do this a thousand times. We're going to have a thousand people flip a fair coin 500 times. So you get this distribution for the proportion of heads, various values for P hat. Uh, and we might ask, so where would a 0.46 be, right? Uh, and just by sheer chance, if the coin were in fact fair, uh, how unlikely is it that we would get something as extreme as 46% when we're performing an experiment of flipping a fair coin 500 times. But bear in mind, we can't get a confidence interval out of this. So we have to try a completely different approach for a confidence interval. Okay, so what do we do? Uh, we saw that uh, 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 in our actual sample, we got 46% heads, 230 heads out of 500. So in our sam so in uh, uh, this applet, let's assume for now that the coin really was 46% heads. We have each, each of 1,000 people or 10,000 or whatever flip the coin 500 times like we did. And then we get this dot plot for uh, uh, value, various values for p hat. Now, wait a minute, you say. You might be going, but here we're assuming that p or pi, the true pi, probably of heads, is 46% or 0.46. And these are uh, various values of p hat that we get. Uh, I, thought, I thought that 0.46 was p hat, and we're trying to figure out where p was. Yeah, but remember, we don't know what p is. So we're basically assuming for now that, uh, that p hat, uh, 0.46, is the true value for p. And we're asking, so based on that assumption, what would be the sampling distribution for p hat? And then we could pick the middle 95% of values or, 90, or the middle 90% of values and use that as our confidence interval. Uh, so that's how you could do a simulation. Uh, you would grab the middle 90% of uh, these values for P, right? You look at this dot plot, pick up the middle 90%, see what that range of values would be, and that would be your confidence interval. Uh, based on a good simulation, uh, you should get something like uh, uh, from 
point four two three to point four nine seven. All right. So again, we're kind of thinking backwards. Uh, we assume our coin. Uh, we assume that the coin was in fact forty six percent heads. Uh, so it so it matched our sample p hat, and we and we do a simulation based on that. I know it seems topsy turvy, but that's a way that you can simulate in such a way that you can construct a confidence interval. So you have you can have a computer pick out percentiles here as your limits. The fifth and the ninety fifth percentile would be the boundaries, the limits for your ninety percent confidence interval. Okay, next time, determining appropriate sample sizes. All right. And now, by the way, I know Nate Silver's getting a lot of heat because he's the, the poll aggregator, but uh, he does a lot of simulations. Uh, well, he did the best he could with the polls he got, I guess. <laughs> it's just the polls he got may have been off. All right, uh, now, by the way, now we're doing uh, uh, confidence intervals for variance and standard deviation, measures of spread. So these are new parameters. Uh, questions in chat, any questions? Or unmute. All right. Hi, everyone. We're now going to do confidence intervals for a population variance, sigma squared, or standard deviation, sigma. And we're going to move away from the central limit theorem, the CLT. So here we're going to find one minus alpha confidence intervals, again, for either sigma squared or sigma. It's the same theory underlying uh, uh, these two confidence uh, intervals. By the way, I apologize. I think I think I'm on the, yeah, I, I, I'm on the wrong video. I, I think I, I pressed the wrong arrow. We're, we're at the previous video here, finding sample size. Okay, let me. Yeah, here we are. Here we are. Okay. Hi hey everyone. <clears throat> How do we determine a sample size n that will get us a confidence interval with a pre-specified margin of error if we're estimating p? Bottom line, you use this formula. And how do we arrive at this formula? Again, don't freak out about this. This was our formula for the margin of error. Using algebra, solve this for n. Solve this formula for n. If you use your algebra, you basically get n equals this inside here, and then round up as necessary to the next integer to be conservative. But wait, there's a problem. Just like before, uh, uh, we, we weren't sure how to get the value for sigma, so there might be different strategies. How are we going to get values for p hat and q hat if we haven't even done any sampling yet? Remember, we haven't called anyone yet, right? If this is a poll, we haven't called anybody yet. We haven't flipped any coins yet. How can we be conservative? What's a worst case scenario? <laughs> well, it's a calculus problem, really. Imagine a rectangle with length p hat and width q hat. So the area is the product, p hat times q hat. These have to add up to one. The sum is one. It's a calculus problem. What are the values of p hat and q hat where the sum is one and you're maximizing the product, the area of this rectangle? It's the square that does that. It's when p hat and q hat are both 0.5. So in a worst case scenario, what's the largest that this product in here can be? 0.5 times 0.5 or 0.25? Obviously, you don't have to prove the calculus in my class, but bottom line, to be super safe and to be conservative, put a 0.25 there. You want to know an irony about polling? Uh, you need the biggest sample size. You have the greatest uncertainty, almost by definition, when political races are close. 50-50. If you have a landslide, if you have a landslide 70%, 30% race, uh, for example, usually if a Republican is running in Utah, for example, then we have less spread. We don't need as much uh, of a sample. But <laughs> uh, almost by definition, for close races, 50-50, you need higher sample sizes. All right, anyway, here's a formula for acquired sample size, where this is the positive critical value for this confidence level. Let's apply these ideas. And by the way, we need n big enough so we can apply normal approximations. Okay. Example two, determining sample size little n. A presidential candidate would like to know the proportion of likely U.S. voters, the whole issue of who's a likely voter, that's a whole other issue. That's, your, that's for your political science professor uh, who intend to vote for the candidate. 
how many likely U.S. voters should we poll? What should little n be, the sample size? We're assuming independence because of the sampling rule. Uh, there's so many likely U.S. voters, we can assume independence for practical purposes. Uh, how many likely U.S. voters should we poll to be 95% confident that our sample proportion, p hat, will be no more than 3.5%, which is the poll margin of error, or MOE, away from the actual proportion okay, of supporters for this candidate. And we're going to use a conservative estimate. So when in doubt, play it safe. Err on the high side, err on raising the value of n within reason. Okay, and we'll interpret the result. And we're going to need these hints from the z distribution. Or you can get these from tables or Excel. Okay. Uh, by the way, uh, this, this full margin of error, you should convert to decimal. 3% uh, is what as a decimal? 3% is 0 0.03. So 3.5% will be 0 0.035. You have to convert this to a decimal. Okay, got to convert to a decimal. <laughs> Otherwise, you'll be way off. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Here's the given formula, all right? Uh, we know that for a 95% confidence interval, we put the positive critical value. 95%, 1.96 for Z. That should sound familiar. Or crank through my Excel spreadsheet. 95%, the standard confidence level, right? Positive critical value, look at that, 1.96. Pretty close. <laughs> all right, so 1.96 goes here. That's squared. All right, and then 0.25 over here to be conservative uh, because it could end up being a close race with close sample results over, remember, E, you put in 0 0.035, not 3.5, otherwise you'll be way off, and that's squared. You end up with 784 likely U.S. voters. That's to play it safe. All right, so interpretation, uh, we should randomly sample 784 likely U.S. voters to be 95% confident that the eventual sample proportion, because we don't know if this candidate is going to get 53% uh, in our poll or 79% or 10%. Well, if you're at 10%, you don't belong in the race. <laughs> but uh, we don't know what the eventual sample proportion would be. But wh whatever it is, okay, it should be no more than 3.5% away from the actual proportion of like the U.S. voters who intend to vote for the candidate. Again, like the U.S. voter, that's for your political science class. <laughs> Maybe look at prior uh, uh, voting participation in midterms or whatever. Now, by the way, uh, what this means is that if you actually have a sample size, N equals 784, you find your P hat, and you construct your confidence interval for P, <clears throat> the true proportion uh, that's going to vote for the candidate. Well, here's the thing. Uh, our confidence interval for P will be centered at P hat, right? P hat will always be at the center of the confidence interval, okay? And this margin of error, okay, well, here's the deal. If it turns out that P hat is exactly 0.5, then this margin of error will exactly be 3.5% or 0 0.035. If, however, uh, P hat is away from 0.5, then actually the margin of error will be smaller. But that's okay because we're playing it safe. We're being conservative. That means that we're providing the candidate with an even more precise confidence interval than was required of us. We just say that 3.5% is the poll margin of error because in a worst case scenario, statistics wise, if it's a 50-50 race, then 3.5% uh, or 0 0.035 is the biggest the margin of error would be in our interval. In practice, it could end up being less, especially if it's a blowout if it's like a 70-30 race. And our sample shows that. Okay, next up, confidence intervals for variance and standard deviation. Next. All right, that's next. Any, any questions thus far? Any questions thus far? All right, so this, uh, this should be the last. Um, yeah, 50 minutes video. Okay, let's just take us to the end. Any questions, any questions? Chi-score distributions now. Hi, everyone. We're now going to do confidence intervals 
for a population variance, sigma squared, or standard deviation, sigma. And we're going to move away from the central limit theorem, the CLT. So here we're going to find one minus alpha confidence intervals, again, for either sigma squared or sigma. It's the same theory underlying uh, uh, these two confidence intervals. Basically, remember, uh, for the standard deviation, it's always the square root of the variance. That's the key distinction. Now, again, remo we're removing ourselves from the CLT. Uh, the key assumption here is that the big daddy distribution really has to be normal. So the methods here are not as robust as before. Uh, another term for robust is distribution free. So the CLT was kind of robust in the sense that we were able to apply it to potentially a variety of distributions as the big daddy distribution. But the Procedures we're going to do here are not as robust because we really need a big daddy distribution that's about normal. And a large sample size won't help us as much. We need normality. All right, well, here are the formulas for a one minus alpha confidence interval for a variance or for a standard deviation. Uh, and in these cases, we're going to use a chi-square distribution on n minus 1 degrees of freedom, just like in the T case. Remember, the chi-square, uh, there, remember there are infinitely many chi-square distributions. We're going to use the one on n minus 1 degrees of freedom, where n is the sample size. Now, here, we're going to have different labels, because remember, chi-square distributions were never what? Chi-square distributions were never, can I find it? <laughs> Chi-square distributions were never what? They were never, ah, they were never negative. Chi-square distributions are never negative in value. So there's no plus or minus jazz, <laughs> no plus or minus jazz. We do have a left critical value and a right critical value. Uh, some comments, some comments. Uh, so for example, in our, uh, Example over here, uh, it turns out that this will be chi-square L, the left critical value, and this will be chi-squared R, the right critical value. All right, it's not plus or minus. Uh, I have several more comments to make about these formulas. Okay, first off, uh, of course, you don't have to memorize these, but look here. If I were to give you this form for the confidence interval for sigma squared, a population variance, notice that you take the square roots of all three parts to get a confidence interval for sigma, the population standard deviation. So the theory is exactly the same. The underlying theory is exactly the same. We're just recognizing that the standard deviation is always, always the square root of the variance. So from here to here, you're just taking square roots all the way through. Okay, so if you know this formula, you can figure out this formula. Now notice, unlike before, we don't have symmetry. So for the first time, uh, we don't have symmetry. Before, when we were doing confidence intervals for mu or for p, we had symmetry. And that was a great friend of ours. So critical values could be uh, between, uh, well, well, critical values, it could be of the form plus or minus something, right? Like plus or minus uh, 1.96. But the confidence intervals here for sigma squared or sigma, these are asymmetric. They're not symmetric. So we will not write the confidence intervals in this form. You might think, oh, can I write a confidence interval for sigma squared as S squared, give or take a margin of error, or something like that for standard div? No. We do not have symmetry. So you are not going to express confidence intervals for sigma squared or sigma in that kind of a form. In fact, there is no margin of error when you're talking about a confidence interval for sigma or sigma squared. Because, for example, maybe uh, for the uh, variance, maybe S squared is over here. The limits turn out to be here and here. Well, what will the margin of error be, right? We don't have symmetry. Okay. 
which means we're going to have to explicitly state a lower limit and an upper limit. There's no margin of error. Now notice, uh, unsurprisingly, if you're going to estimate sigma squared or sigma, the sample variance, which is the square of the sample standard deviation, it depends on what you're given, right? If you're given the sample standard deviation S, then square it, right? Uh, if, you're, if you're given the sample variance, just use it, plug it in here. But it makes sense that these confidence intervals uh, would involve a sample variance or standard deviation. But notice that these formulas do not involve X bar. X bar is not directly a part of these formulas. Now you could use X bar to calculate the sample variance or standard deviation, but the sample mean itself is not a part of these directly, which actually makes sense because variance and standard deviation are measures of spread. So in principle, the center doesn't really matter. Again, the center, the sample mean could help you calculate S or S squared, but once you get S or S squared, uh, I, I don't care, right? Like for example, let's say that uh, uh, the class takes a test and the scores are between zero and 100 points and we get some uh, sample standard deviation. Let's say five points. Let's say I'm generous and I say, hey, I'm going to give everybody 10 more points on the exam. Well, the sample mean, or in fact, the population mean will go up by 10 points, but will the spread change? No. The, sample, the, the population standard deviation will still be five points. You're not changing the spread. Okay. So uh, if, you, if I give everyone 10 more points on the test, it changes the center where that is, but doesn't change the spread. Right? We're, we're going from here to here. We change the center, but not the spread. By, I, by the way, I got more generous, didn't I? I went from five points to 10 points. And I, um, oh, no, no, no. I said five points was a, was a standard deviation. I said if I raise 10 points. No, I, I know what I'm talking about now. <laughs> I add 10 points to everyone's exam. Not that I'm going to do that. <laughs> All right. Also, this might confuse you. Wait, why is the right critical value in the left fraction and the left critical value in the right fraction? The greater value is here. The lesser value is here. Well, here's the thing. Uh, let's say that uh, I ask you, I have a piece of, I have this pizza here, okay? One person eats a third of the pizza, another person eats a half of the pizza. Who's eating more and who's eating less? The person eating a third of the pizza is eating less, right? Here's a third of the pizza, here's half of the pizza. And the reason is that everything's positive, the tops are the same, okay? But here we're dividing the pizza into three pieces. Here we're dividing the pizza into halves. So what I'm saying is that because the denominator here is bigger and everything's positive and the tops are the same, because the bottom here is bigger, the overall fraction is smaller. Likewise, this bottom is smaller, so the overall fraction is bigger. In other words, if you believe that one-third is less than one-half, you should believe that this is less than that. All right. Rounding rules. Okay, round off the limits of the confidence intervals to the same number of decimal places as the given value of S squared or S. If we want to be conservative, round out. Round down the lower limit and round up the, lim the upper limit, just like before. Uh, that will tend to widen the CI a bit. Let's do an example. A 90% confidence interval for a population variance and a population standard deviation. So let's say that, oh, so why would we want to do something like this? Let's say that we have a company that produces pills, hopefully legal pills. And let's say that uh, uh, these pills, uh, you know, uh, 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 are supposed to be uh, so many milligrams, right? like 500 milligrams or whatever. Okay, now if you have pills in a bottle, aren't you going to be worried if one pill looks like that and another pill looks like that? You might be kind of worried, right? Your pill should be fairly consistent because you want consistency, right? In fact, one of the biggest problems in hospitals is problems of dosages, people being given incorrect doses. They're supposed to get 50 cc's of something instead of get 500. So if you have a, a pill bottle with these different sized pills, you might want to question the manufacturer. <laughs> or like Barbie doll heads, right? Here's a Barbie doll body, right? 
well, you don't want one head that looks like that, another head that looks like that. <laughs> All right. So by mass, the pills produced by a company are approximately normally distributed. We need that assumption. Let's say we randomly select 20 pills. So little n is 20. That's the sample size. And therefore, that means we'll have how many degrees of freedom? N minus 1. 19 degrees of freedom. And let's say that based on our Excel spreadsheet, the sample variance is 210 square micrograms. Find a 90% confidence interval, CI, for the population variance, sigma squared, for the mass of the pills. Uh, um, and then later on in part B, we'll do the standard deviation, a confidence interval for the standard deviation. So sigma squared over here in A, sigma over here in B. We'll start with A. All right, here, here are some key hints. Here are the critical values from the chi-square distribution. Uh, in my Excel spreadsheet, uh, I'll, uh, I'll give you this Excel spreadsheet to work things out, but show me your work on the homework. Okay, here's the uh, sample size. I should call this the sample size. Okay, the number of degrees of freedom will be n minus one, so that's automatic in black. The sample variance, you would input, 210 square units. So you enter these two, and also the confidence level, 90% or 0.9. After that, it's gonna be automatic. 90% uh, confidence level, alpha is 10%, half of alpha is 5%, right? So this left critical value cuts off 5% to the left. It turns out the right critical value will cut off the complement, 95% to the left. Okay, so I'm using the chisq.inv to get percentiles of a chi-square distribution. Uh, here's the left tail probability, and here's the number of degrees of freedom. I refer to D5 up here. So here's the left critical value. Here's the right critical value. Notice they're both positive, right? Both these critical values will be positive. It's not plus or minus. Again, uh, the probability here is the complement of the probability here. 95% versus 5%. All right, uh, and then we plug these in. Remember that this goes in the right fraction, this goes in the left fraction. Okay, uh, remember we assumed a normal distribution. So our 90% confidence interval based on this formula, right? Uh, N minus one, which is the number of degrees of freedom, that was 20 minus one or 19 times the sample variance, that was 210, over the right critical value. That was the bigger number over to the right, the 30.144, okay? That goes in the left fraction. And then over here, in the right fraction, we picked the left critical value, the 10.117. That goes over here. The tops are the same. So when you round, this, round these limits off, you get 132, square micrograms over to 394 square micrograms. Uh, so my Excel spreadsheet, it found that out. If you round these off, 132 to 394. Or if you round out, you round this down to, again, 132, but you would round this up to 395. That's if you want to apply that principle of being conservative, if you're rounding out. But either is fine, I'll accept you. All right, interpretation, we are 90% confident that this interval contains the population variance of the mass of the pills produced by the company. Regarding standard deviation, we take the square roots of the above. Now, um, you might be tempted to grab the 132 and either this or this and just take square roots of that, but you're losing too much accuracy. You take the square roots of these guys before they're rounded off. So unfortunately, you gotta take these original values. In my Excel spreadsheet, I do that. I refer to these original values. So don't use the rounded off values. Okay, so see when I work this out, I don't just stick 132 there and 394 or 395 there. Okay, I gotta rework it, okay? Or, or get these from memory in your calculator. But yeah, work these out. It's the square roots of the, the raw left side and raw right sides from above. And this time, for standard deviation, we round off to uh, 12 to 20, or we round out, we can round this down to 11, round this up to 20, right? So we have either 11 or 12 micrograms, the straight unit, 
is less than sigma, which is less than uh, 20 micrograms. The lower limit is here, either 12 or 11 micrograms. The upper limit is here, 20 micrograms. Uh, you can put this in interval form. We are 90% confident that this interval contains the population standard deviation of the mass of the pills produced by the company. Confidence intervals. Next time, we're going to introduce ideas of hypothesis testing and how we can use confidence intervals to derive conclusions. Next time. Okay, so we're basically done with constructing confidence intervals, or I am in a way. <laughs> okay, work the homework. Okay, and then we're gonna do lesson 32, a key idea a lesson on Monday. So in the meantime, you can do everything through lesson 31. Uh, that's it for today. We've had a nice, long day. Uh, well, for many people on election, you know, election day, post-election day, it's a long day, right? But um, I'll stick around for questions. All right. All right. So clicking this off. Uh, okay. So we're at 936. All right. So for, uh, for many of you, good night, but I'm willing to uh, stick around, willing to stick around. Oh, okay. Well, I, you know, I've been keeping up with the political news. So in Nevada, uh, Biden's ahead a bit, less than a percent. But the thing is, the the remaining outstanding vote appears to be Democratic because it's mostly Clark County absentees. So that's probably going to be a Democratic vote. Uh, Ar actually, Arizona is closing a bit. Uh, uh, Biden's up maybe a two to three percent in Arizona. But the yeah, I'm hearing different things. The the latest vote dump from Maricopa County was 59% Republican, but I was reading, um, oh, I was gonna say Twitter, but you gotta be careful about stuff on Twitter, but th 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 there's at least one political reporter, I think, who's saying that, uh, that it's more democratic after the most recent dump. So Arizona may go back and forth. Yes, I've been watching this stuff very closely. That's why I started studying statistics. <laughs> yeah. Back when I was 17, 18, I would have loved Steve Kornacki's job or John King's. But now, I don't know. I want to be on TV. You can see I don't like showing my face on screen. So, <laughs> Pennsylvania, James Carville says that that's probably going to end up with like a 125, 130,000, maybe 150,000 lead for Biden in the end. Uh, Georgia's close. Uh, Georgia, uh, the consensus is that, uh, yeah, yeah, there, there's an operative in Georgia who says that it might go slightly to Biden. So if Biden wins everything else except North Carolina, he ends up with what? I think I think 304. It's 290 with Pennsylvania. I think 304 with Georgia. Hmm. Any questions about the election? <laughs> Professor, what's your opinion on the Trafalgar poll? Trafalgar group poll. Oh, the, uh, Trafalgar, yeah. Well, you know, um, the thing was, uh, they became famous be in part because uh, they, they showed a Trump win. But on the other hand, there are many people like Nate Silver uh, who were saying, well, actually that poll is very bad because um, remember, Hillary Clinton did win the popular vote by about uh, two and a half to three percent, right? Uh, and the polls actually averaged about that. Remember, especially the polls that came out after the James Comey letter, right? Um, they were, the, the polls were actually pretty good in terms of determining Hillary Clinton's overall popular vote nationwide. It was in the particular states of Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, where, see, see, Hillary was polling in the high 40s, but she was not breaking 50%, in part because of Gary Johnson and Jill Stein. Uh, but Trump got a lot of the undecideds and a lot of the late breakers. Uh, so, uh, and, and in many ways, Hillary, Hillary Clinton was almost like an incumbent because, you know, um, the incumbent administration was Democratic. Uh, she was associated with being uh, very much part of the system, right? Uh, very much a, a Democratic Party uh, politician, right? So in many ways, she was an incumbent. Uh, but the thing about incumbents is that they often stall at their polling number, you know? Uh, that was a danger, danger for Trump. Trump's approval rating was 45% nationwide. So that, that was a danger for him. But for Trafalgar, um, yeah, actually, in many ways, they're the worst. They're one of the worst polls in 2016 because, no, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote and Trafalgar... Uh, was claiming that she'd lose the popular vote, which is not the case. 
Donald Trump won because of the particular peculiarities of uh, 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 Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, right? And the fact that the state polls were off then. The fact, that, the fact of the matter was that the state polls were bit off, even though, e even then, uh, they did pretty well at getting Hillary Clinton's percent, but the thing was Donald Trump got that late surge. And as for other models, because I was looking at other models, like the, I, I think it was called the primary model by a German professor, I think, that's predicted like 25 out of 27 elections. And I, I, I wanted to know what you thought about that or if you knew about that. No, I haven't heard about that. Um, now, in terms of elections, it depends on which ones they're describing, right? So I, I assume you're talking about the, the competitive elections, right? We're not talking about safe incumbents. We're talking about competitive elections. Uh, now, bear in mind, sometimes you're just lucky. Uh, as we mentioned in the uh, Poisson Scatter, the bombings of London, sometimes a group will just get lucky and then get very unlucky other times. Uh, Nate Silver was very lucky in 20... What was it, 2012, I think? Nate Silver was very uh, fortunate or very lucky in 2012. Uh, but we're, we're going to see something called the regression to the mean, which is that if you're very lucky in one year, then it's also likely that you won't be as lucky the next time. That that's an idea called regression to the mean, yeah. Um, but no, I haven't heard about the German group. No. It's, I think it's called the primary model. I I I got the name wrong. The primary model. Yeah, I, I'll write that down because uh, you know I, I I've been studying polls for you know I often track political polls. Uh, uh, actually, the stats professors I knew uh, got to statistics, statistics because of baseball, right? Because baseball fans. Uh, really obsessive baseball fans can enjoy statistics. And, and I, I knew some professors who became stats professors because they loved baseball. Uh, I studied statistics because I enjoyed watching uh, elections and polls. Uh, like I said, uh, Steve Kornacki, I would have loved his job back when I was 18, 19, but I think I'd be too shy to appear on TV. <laughs> Steve Kornacki or John King. Is is the statistics thing for baseball? Is that like the Moneyball movie? Is that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think it's at a more sophisticated level because fans look at basic things like you know your hitting average. They look at very basic statistics. Um, Moneyball is more sophisticated because because um, I'm trying to think. Like like it 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 would show that that some of the underrated players. There were underrated players who were being undervalued. That was that was the the key insight. That there are certain players who were good, but they were undervalued. Um, and also, there was there was uh, there are other analyses you can do with baseball. No, oh yeah, oh yeah. If you're interested in baseball specifically, like what Moneyball dealt with, then uh, yeah, there's lots of information. Bill James. Uh, there's a famous. Uh, uh, I don't know if he was actually trained as a statistician, but I don't think he was. But there's a guy named Bill James, and he's he's considered to be. Uh, the godfather of baseball statistics. Um, for political statistics, you might go to someone like Michael Barone, uh, who's been in it for many decades. Uh, of, of course, you have John King on CNN, Steve Kornacki on MSNBC. <laughs> yeah, I could talk for a long time about politics, <laughs> politics and polls. <laughs> um, all right. Any any questions about uh, either you know the statistics we've been doing lately or polls, elections? <laughs> any questions or or comments? If you just want to comment or <laughs> yeah, I I have a comment. Um, I I, I hope you don't. I hope you don't mind it. But I I googled you when I when I was looking for for statistics professors and I saw that you were part of the citizens beat when you were young. Uh, yeah, I've had students tell me that. Yeah. And they got a kick out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed yeah. the social sciences. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I reveal part of my background. Um, actually my strength early on was the social sciences and I, I actually was involved in politics in high school even uh, back in the eighties, not too many people were, but I, I sort of uh, early on, I was just in politics right now. Lot, now lots of young people are interested in politics. Yeah. So, uh, but then I, I was thinking about being a political science professor, but I remember my old biology, my old high school biology teacher saying, I don't know, uh, if you say political science, you tend to go on and sell insurance or something, right? Yeah, I mean, can you really get a useful job with that? 
Um, and, and how can I really change things, right? I, I mean, I enjoy watching elections, but I don't know if, if uh, I would be helpful as a political science professor. Um, I thought I'd be more helpful uh, you know, learning math. Well, you know, I, I studied statistics in college in part because I, I knew that I could apply it to anything. So I didn't have to decide on a, on a field yet, right? I could be a teacher. I could uh, go into medicine, politics, like political polling. Um, so, you know, if you, if you study applied math and statistics, then you're useful in all sorts of ways. I, I didn't have to determine my life yet. <laughs> Actually, I got into teaching because of uh, the Upward Bound Tutoring Program for underprivileged uh, High school students, that's what got me into teaching. So I combined the two, my, my applied math background and uh, the tutoring experience. Yeah. Hmm. Anyway, that's my life story. <laughs> I know some instructors do that on day one, but I don't want to waste people's time. But if people ask, I'll talk. <laughs> yeah, it was, I, I actually like watched the, watched a couple, like maybe 30 minutes of it. Uh, <laughs> I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I love game shows, you know, um, uh, bear in mind, uh, the actual skills that make you succeed in life, uh, they, they more involve your ability to work with people and be able to judge situations, right? Um, but, uh, but I was a very good book learner in high school, right? And that took me a long way, don't get me wrong. But um, I, I found that in life and in my job, actually, it's your interactions with people and your emotional intelligence that will really take you further. And I think studies have shown that. <laughs> Yeah, certainly in politics, that's the case. Um, I think. As, as for politics, how exactly did you start getting into politics when you were younger? Well, it was way back in 1986. The first election I saw was uh, 1986. I was 14 years old, I guess. And I, and I was very enthralled by the videos, right? And, and it was a big year because in 1986, the Democrats took control of the Senate. Uh, so that was a big year, right? And I, I really love the graphics they showed. And that started getting me into politics. Um, and then also, I was, I, I, well, even before that, I was interested, you know, uh, I, I enjoyed uh, watching the news, reading the newspaper. I like being informed, right? Uh, and then I was enthralled by election night. So uh, I'm a lot like Steve Kornacki on MSNBC. Like he was very similar. He would uh, watch a lot of the old uh, election programs and, and they, we loved watching the old colors, right? Blue and red. Sometimes blue would be Republicans sometimes, right? Uh, blue and red started becoming a thing in 2000 with Bush and Gore. But, um, but yeah, and then, and then uh, later on, I worked on a political campaign in 1988, uh, did some more political work in uh, college. But then after I graduated um, undergraduate, uh, I just didn't have time to do politics. Yeah, but I still, I still watch it. And, and yeah, I, I was on my toes. I mean, I watched the election returns very carefully yesterday and today, uh, not just as someone interested in politics and issues, but as a, as a statistics professor, right? Um, in fact, if someone, asked, if someone were to tell me, hey, Ken, you're wasting your time. You should be doing this or that. I know I should have been grading your homework, right? <laughs> but uh, I tell people, hey, I'm studying, if I'm studying election results, right, I'm studying statistics and, and it's part of my teaching, which is true, right? <laughs> that's not so far-fetched. So uh, that's my excuse. On election night and the day after, I study polls and statistics and election returns in part to, to uh, you know, train myself as a statistics professor, right? And I may, may have better things to say. Like I said, my, my old college professors, they got to statistics through baseball. With me, it was politics and elections. Yeah, to, to each his own. <laughs> of course, statistics is used uh, now a lot in um, you know, Google, Facebook, social media, right? They use, they use uh, big data, um, what do they call it? Big data and uh, there's, there's a name, there's another name I'm looking for. Big data, big data is one term they use. Yeah, I forgot, yeah. But yeah, yeah, social media, they use statistics all the time. So that's my plug for applied math and statistics. <laughs> yeah, and, and you said you, you got into, I, did, I don't know if you said you got into politics directly because of, but you said you really enjoyed, like you, were, you really read a lot of books. Um, you said you talked about emotional intelligence and all that. Do you have any recommendations um, as for like getting into politics? Because like what I found like like right now is like an easier route or I think a more common route to politics right now is like through political commentators, like more on. That's true, news. especially in the age of Donald Trump. That's very true, actually. I mean, the ones on Fox News have become very influential. Um, 
Sean Hannity uh, most notably so. But um, uh, now, now the whole thing about emotional intelligence, that's more psychology, right? And I also studied psychology a lot in high school. In fact, if, if I had my dream, I might have double majored in political science and psychology, but uh, um, I, I, I want to be more practical. So I majored in applied math. I did consider a major or a minor in psychology. I, took some, I did take some psychology classes. In fact, I audited a, a course on the psychology of mind control from Philip Zimbardo. He was the guy who did the Stanford prison experiment. Uh, that was the experiment where they turned the basement of the psychology building into a, into a mock prison. And uh, the people were going crazy, right? The guards were abusing their power. The prisoners were, were becoming, were going, they were going crazy. So um, uh, yeah, I, I kind of took the professor who did that experiment. Um, so yeah, I, I studied both applied math and psychology in college. Uh, emotional intelligence is, is more a psychology issue. And, and it's something that, uh, um, it's something that I became more aware of after I graduated, actually. Uh, there's a book by Daniel Goldman or Goldman. Uh, it might be G-O-L-E-M-A-N. It, it might be a uh, Goldman. Whoops. Yeah. Uh, it might be Goldman, Daniel Goldman. But he wrote a famous book on emotional intelligence. And that started a little college, cottage, um, cottage industry on that. So be careful. Make sure that the book you're reading is from an expert. <laughs> But Daniel Goldman's book was the was really the uh, the groundbreaking book that got people interested in it because people were wondering if there were alternatives to IQ, you know, intelligence quotient, these standardized tests, right? Uh, more and more, you're seeing the SATs being disregarded in college admissions, uh, and and uh, and then you could say that in real life, right? Emotional intelligence is what carries you. You could say that that uh, uh, well, Barack Obama certainly had the greatest political emotional intelligence in many ways, uh, and, and he had charisma. And then you had Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton for all of her competence and knowledge and intelligence. Uh, uh, in many ways, she was very lacking in terms of her political skills and political emotional intelligence. Using the word deplorables, that was a bad idea. It really was. Because too many people thought they were talking, too many people thought she was talking about them. <laughs> I yeah, I was looking for the, Go ahead. For the book. I thought I read that one you mentioned, but no, it's, I think I read one, it's emotional intelligence, like 2.0 or 1.0. Oh yeah, there are lots of books written about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, the Goldman book is, is sort of the groundbreaking one. That's what got people interested in it, right? Um, it's, it's the first notable book called Emotional Intelligence. And, and I'm sure that there have been a number of books. Yeah, if you, if you I mean, in fact, you can go on amazon.com right now. I'm sure you can find a bunch of books on emotional intelligence. But that's the thing that's really going to take you through life. Uh, I mean, I, I know at least one colleague, I won't uh, say the person's name, but I know one colleague who's, who's very um, intelligent. Uh, th this person is very sharp, very quick, has a great memory, better memory than I do. But the problem with this person is that this person is, is very lacking in, in uh, communication skills. This person is too sharp, too sarcastic, uh, can't really control themselves. So this person has a, a pretty high IQ, but a pretty low EQ. And that's, that's not serving that person very well, actually. <laughs> Good teacher, though. So, so uh, intelligence is multifaceted. Yeah. yeah, I remember when I was reading up on it, I was really surprised like, by the relation between like, salaries and, and the EQ versus like, IQ, like the, how the, they earn like, higher wages, the people with higher EQs and, and stuff. I remember I got into it through business. And that got me into like, now you were just saying like about your acquaintance. Um, and that got me thinking like about, I don't know if uh, you've probably read it, but the Dale Carnegie, the super famous book, the How to Influence. Oh, yes, um, yes. Uh -huh. um, and I, is that sort of the emotional intelligence, like the beginnings of that? Oh, are, are you talking about like the self-help books? Yeah. Well, uh, that is like a really self-help book, but, but yeah, kind of. Well, yeah, I guess, I guess almost, uh, I mean, you're, you're talking about the general field of psychology, really, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, what, what uh, it, it really is psychology in a very broad sense. And there have been, a, you know, a million books <laughs> written about psychology in a very broad sense, right? Um, and sure, uh, you know, there are lots of books that would touch on emotional intelligence. Oh, by the way, Hui, I, I want to ask you something. Um, uh, I'm still recording right now, but if you want, I can trim this off. Uh, do you care? Does it matter?
so so uh, right now it's recording, but I can I can trim off this part. We are that okay. Um, should I stop recording? Right now we're recording. I can stop it and I can trim it. Oh, what happened? <laughs> okay. Um, any questions? Any questions? I think that was it for me. It was nice talking to you. Okay. Uh, oh yeah. Oh so, yeah. Wait. I wanted to ask you. Um. Uh. Uh. uh I. I was still recording. Uh, I can trim it off, though. I mean, it was kind of a, a conversation between you and me. But um, would you like me to trim that part off? Wait, are you talking to me or are you talking to yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm talking to yeah. Uh, uh, would you like me to trim this part of the video off? Um, no, I, I don't. I think I don't have a problem with it. It's... Okay, yeah, because because yeah, I was talking because I mean we had an interesting conversation and you know so, so, usually I leave these on unless the person objects and it's like uh, we have interesting conversations. It's after talk gab. And I talked about myself in case people were curious. <laughs> yeah, no, I have and, no problem. With it. Yeah, and also, and also, you, this other students, you know, other students talking about their interests and and their observations. And and hey, I think it's good for people to know that that more than anything else, more than anything you study in college, emotional intelligence is really the key that'll uh, get, take you a long way. And I wish my college would know that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really interesting. Oh yes, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, yeah, be multifaceted, right? Uh, it, it's important to be intelligent in many different ways, whether it's books or people or, or cars or, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think that's why self-help is so appealing to people. It's like you can learn a new skill, like just by, by reading for a couple months. It's, well, that's really what got me into a lot of self-help books apart from like business. Oh, yes. And I think, I think uh, uh, you know, as human beings, I think we often try to improve ourselves. And for some of us, like me, you know, I, I would often learn a lot from books. But for many people, you know, they, they might uh, uh, enjoy boating. I, I have a colleague who enjoys boating and he's had lots of great experiences. So you learn a lot about the world and yourself uh, from experiences as well, right? So, but it depends on you. I mean, you know, some people like me, you know, and maybe you, I don't know, but maybe we're more, we learn more from books. We, we enjoy books more. Other people like my colleague might, might learn more about themselves in the world through boating or sailing adventures, right? So um, there are many ways to experience the world and to learn about yourself, right? Uh, and, and, and never be ashamed or afraid of the challenges that you face. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, I, I definitely agree. I am definitely one of those book people or those bookworms. Um, and and right now I'm actually like writing my my UC apps and and I've noticed like how much they help me like with with like quotes and stuff like for quoting certain authors they just come to me naturally for for my essays right now mm -hmm. and it's uh, and it's really been like super helpful. Yeah, uh, even though I'm bad at memorizing quotes, I, I enjoy quotations because um, it, it helps to frame experiences in my life I, it, it helps me to interpret experiences in my life in different ways so yeah i yeah but i mean some people call them cliches but i don't, I don't like judging them i mean i mean yeah i mean I, very often the reason why some things are cliches is because they're true in a lot of situations right you know one, one of the one of the old phrases uh we often hear certain phrases they're called cliches but but the reason why they're so common is because they're often true right <laughs> so don't be afraid to uh to think about uh, something that might be called cliche even because, you know, uh, sometimes the old wisdom is true. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. And sometimes it's wrong. And sometimes you got to go out on your own, but <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's being a human being, right? I mean, you know, uh, it's, it's a matter of, uh, 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 of balancing, how, of balancing influences from society at large and how you forge your own individual identity, you know? Um, the kind of music I, I, I when I grew up in high school, the kind of music I enjoyed dealt with those kinds of issues. So I enjoyed music from The Who, Pink Floyd, um, Yes, <laughs> uh, various bands that sort of reflected on you know, the individual versus society, right? And, and sometimes you want to 
conform. Other times you want to break away. Yeah. And emotional intelligence is part of that, knowing when to conform and get along and when, uh, when and how to assert yourself. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and another, like, another genre, or it's probably the same genre, but uh, the, like, from emotional intelligence, I don't, I don't know if you've read this book, but it's like, it's called Habit, I think, Power of Habit. And it also deals with, with like the emotional intelligence aspect of it. And, and it, it gives really good examples and really eye-opening examples. Um, and it also deals with that um, the emotional intelligence aspect of that. It's, it's called habit, H-A-B-I-T? The power of habit. Ah. It's like, uh, it's, a sm it's like a medium-sized book. It has like, it, the cover page has like a, it's like a yellow t cover page. It's like, I think it's a pretty popular book, but I, I might be wrong. Well, oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, because, yeah, you know, I, um, I don't have too much time to read, but I love free reading. Um, I find myself reading the news a lot, right? Because I get emails with news, but I, I enjoy reading. So uh, now, now the problem is that I don't have too much free time, right, very often. But uh, when I do get some time when I want to sit down, I, I, I enjoy reading. It's usually news reports, but um, yeah, I mean, I enjoy reading psychology. Um, uh, like one recent book I read, uh, I'm, I'm single, I'm not married. I never want to get married. So I read this book about, um, uh, about being single. Right. And, uh, uh yeah, it was very interesting about the single life and how many people are happier that way. It's, it was written by an NYU sociologist. Yeah. And, 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 now that you say that about how you like to read a lot of the newspapers and stuff, uh, like a couple, like I found myself going that same route. Like I, I started getting really into politics and, and all of that, but then I like kind of burned out. Um, I don't know if you can relate, but it's like, I started like watching so many commentators, so many like news outlets that I just burn out because it's a bit overwhelming. Um, like with all the elections and with all the like such polarization right yeah. now. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, I, I love this stuff and yet I feel very worn right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I had a massive headache. Um, oh yeah. 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 It was hard to get some sleep sometimes. Headache. Yeah. It was good when I got some good sleep. When you get some good sleep, it feels really good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But yesterday I was, I was all nervous and uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't sleep well. Tuesday morning, so I was that was very bad Tuesday. But then I had a good sleep today. <laughs> oh yeah, me too. I I never. This was like my first actual presidential election that I was like actually like a bit informed about it. Uh -huh. And I and I was super nervous. I was like, I, I used to play soccer, so I I got really nervous before games, and I felt like I was about to play a soccer game like before the election started. Right. I I understand that. Right. Right. Um. um uh, yeah, well, I, I, yeah I, I hope I hope that uh, you uh, you were happy with uh, I, I don't know uh, yeah so I hope I hope that you, that you feel satisfied with the results <laughs> I guess I, 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 yeah <laughs> yeah I'm still I'm still a bit um, confused as to what's gonna happen but ah right right yeah um, but overall I think it's uh, not that bad. Yeah, let's so let's hope for the best. Um, I, I think we'll be okay. I think we'll be okay. Um, yeah, because uh, today was fairly peaceful, right? Um, I mean, there's that one guy, there's that one guy in, I guess, Arizona who was mouthing off. <laughs> yeah, but I didn't uh, see that. yeah, did you see that guy? No, I didn't. No, no, um, he was a uh, uh, he happened to be a Trump supporter, but he was in Arizona and and they were they were giving a public announcement about the vote. And uh, there was a guy in a Trump shirt who was who was yelling about how uh, Biden was stealing the election. Uh, so that was that was the that was one of the few uh, notable, um, I guess, protests or exclamations that we've heard. But overall, uh, you know, it's it's been peaceful. I don't think I don't I haven't heard really of violence really. So so far we're good. Whichever whichever side you may have supported, uh, yeah. <laughs> so far we're good. Yeah. No, I actually saw like I think it's in. Mar Maricopa, um, I think like MSNBC reported that there was like armed 
Trump supporters or something like that. Yeah, I just saw that right before I started class. Um, as the poll watchers were leaving, um, yeah, I watched MSNBC also, and and uh, yeah, they're being accosted by uh, some of the Trump supporters, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I I saw that, but I I didn't actually see pictures of it, but but I but I saw the report on that. But it's funny how um, I was watching MSNBC last night, and uh, actually Rachel Maddow was a uh, was a college classmate of mine. Actually, uh, we were in the same dormitory complex. We're the same age. So I was in I was in the neighboring uh, dorm dormitory to hers. Uh, so I saw her. I, I'd see her a couple of times um, in, in college, but I didn't know her that well. But um, but yeah, I knew I knew I I, uh, I saw Rachel Maddow around uh, my first year of college. Yeah, um, but but yeah, she and Joy Reid were saying uh, they were very. Uh, they they knew that there would be a red mirage that in in the industrial midwestern states, right? Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, but they never took it to heart, and they they felt very nervous as the election results came in. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. I saw that from Rachel Maddow. She was like disappointed, and she was like, I think she said something like along the lines of she didn't even see ripples, right? Or or something like that for, for the blue wave or whatever she was expecting. Yeah. Well, so well I read it from the Hill that she was really disappointed in the, in the actual turnout. Right, yeah, because yesterday, uh, well, yeah, uh, but especially yesterday, because um, days before, people like Dave Wasserman, uh, the political expert, they were saying that, um, yeah, expect that Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania will look Republican at first, but then they're going to turn more democratic with time as the mail ballots came in. But the thing was, you know, Rachel Maddow and Joy Reid, they were so used to, to, to um, obsessing over the incoming numbers, and so was I, you know, that uh, even though they knew that the states would go from red to blue, they were still very anxious. Uh, the, the word that Rachel used was uh, fraught. Uh, she felt that thing, she, she felt fraught. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, and on CNN, uh, there was a, a commentator. She was a, a young black woman, and she uh, she was a I guess a Biden supporter. And she used the word autopsy because we use the word autopsy uh, uh, when we assume that that our side has lost, and um, there has to be an analysis of what happened, right? Like when when Mitt Romney lost, uh, the Republicans said that they were having an autopsy on what happened with Mitt Romney's loss in 2012, and uh, the de and and this uh, uh, one uh, uh, young woman. Uh, was was saying that uh, yes, I, I wonder if the autopsy will show that. I, I wonder if the autopsy will show what happened with the Latino vote in South Florida. So even though, you know, uh, she, uh, so even though we didn't get all the votes in yesterday by any means, already you had some Democrats who were talking about autopsy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, and the Latino as for the Latino vote, I, I kind of saw that coming. Um, because I, I like I like really follow the UFC closely and, and and I don't know if you're familiar with it, but like Dana White, the owner is like a really um vocal Trump supporter. Uh huh. Um and, and he has a lot of fighters like from Florida and that area that are like Latinos and they like I think they partnered with like Donald Trump Jr. and with Donald Trump and they were like campaigning for him. So I think, like, the fact that they were such big superstars and they were, like, promoting this idea of, like, fighting socialism or whatever, like, I think that maybe influenced a bit of the, of the vote there since they were campaigning so hard for that. For that. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I was watching CNN also, and uh, Ana Navarro, who is a former Republican but is now very anti-Trump, she's from Florida, and she's, I think she's Nicaraguan-American. Uh, but she's she's kind of anti-communist herself. But she made she made the comment that uh, uh, that she was she was freaked out by what was happening in Florida because she's very anti-Trump. But Florida went pretty strongly for Trump because of the Latino vote, right? And uh, uh, yeah, I'm trying to remember what she yeah yeah. And she was commenting on uh, on uh, yeah that South Florida vote and um, uh, someone someone else. Uh, no no, it was it was uh, uh, on MSNBC. Chuck Rocha. Chuck Rocha is a Latino Democratic consultant, and I guess he's he's in Florida. And he said that um, uh, that 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 uh, Trump was on in early June with ads uh, painting Biden as a socialist, right? 
uh, not, he didn't talk, Trump didn't talk about himself. He talked about Biden being a socialist. So he, he framed the narrative, right? And he, he basically painted uh, Joe Biden as a socialist early on. And, and the Biden campaign didn't, didn't go on uh, with, I guess, the Spanish language ads, for example, until late July. So, um, so yeah, yeah, as part, as part of the autopsy in Florida, right, in Florida specifically, um, uh, even if Biden wins overall, they're going to be curious what happened in Florida. Uh, yeah, what, what happened with those, that's going to be the number one question. What exactly happened with the Latino vote? Um, the Cuban vote is only about a, a quarter of that. So you can't just explain it with, with the uh, Cuban-American vote. Yeah, yeah. And wait, I was going to say something, and I forgot what, was, what I was going to say. But... Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So uh, this, this, this is this is Emilio. I'm sorry. I, I thought I was talking with Hui because uh, Hui was making a political comment there. Okay. Sorry. Oh, that, yeah. That's why I was confused about. I didn't know if I was ignoring you or or not. Yeah. When. Yeah. I'm sorry. I got confused because uh, Hui was asking the political question. So. Yeah, Hui was making the political comment, and then. Uh, yeah, I assume that you're you're Emilio. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Emilio. <laughs> yeah, nice to meet you. I I've never stayed late, but. Given the election, I, I I wanted to like hear 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 your say on on some other things, since you have that statistics background. But 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 I, what was what I was gonna say because you talked about like the the ads for the like that he painted Biden as a socialist. He like turned that narrative around. Yeah. I, I I I like want to say that that was partly because of like Kamala Harris like opened up that that avenue for like those type of attacks. Um, but that was just what I was expecting. Like I was expecting that since some of the things she said are like more left leaning than, than, than Biden's, I was like expecting for Trump to take that route on the, yeah. well, well, on the actual... in the primaries, Kamala Harris was very much in the middle. Uh, she was still to the right of people like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. Right. But, um, uh, the, the thing is though, it, it was Fox news, Fox news and the Republicans were the ones who tried to paint her as this lefty. Um, but actually, you know, she, she was a former attorney general of California. She's considered like the top cop. Right. Um, so I think, I think it was a painting of her, right. It was, uh, the, the right was trying to paint her as a socialist. And, uh, I, I wonder if part of that is because she is a black woman, you know, and, and we tend to associate uh, black women with liberal politics. So there might've been some, uh, maybe some stereotyping there, for example. Right. So, um, uh, I, I don't think I don't think uh, Kamala Harris is a socialist by any means. She's a very mainstream Democrat, um, but uh, but she was painted early on by Fox News and and the Republicans as being um, very left wing when really she's not. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Yeah, I I remember because I actually watched some of those criticisms of her, um, and I remember they kept on attacking her for like. Um, I don't remember. I think she was, I think one of the things that people were like on the right were like super like um, riled up about was, I think she, I think she was joking, but she talked about like banning, I don't know what type of guns, but with like affirmative, with not affirmative action, but with executive privilege, I think. And I think that put, that like gave the right, like a lot of like lanes to, to be like, oh, look at how, radical she is or, or whatever because i remember that was a key talking point on on like some of the more right-leaning right-leaning like commentators yeah but you know if if you go over um all the statements that a political figure makes you can find a, a sentence here a sentence there right or take things out of context uh but uh, but no, i think i think kamala harris is a very mainstream democrat but i think I, I think uh, because she is a, a black woman, right? Um, uh, perhaps the most prominent black woman uh, next to, well, I guess there's there's a, a Michelle Obama and even in some ways Oprah Winfrey in the broader public sphere. But uh, uh, but uh, Kamala Harris, I think I think because she is a black woman, I, I think that uh, again Republicans and uh, Fox News especially, they again it was it was easier to frame her as a liberal because uh, of course if you look at the statistics, right? Uh, uh, black women are perhaps the strongest demographic for the Democrats, right? Specifically black women. Um, I remember the, the, the um, Doug, Joyne, Doug, Doug Jones, Roy Moore race in Alabama, uh, black women were like 98 to two. 
<laughs> and wasn't that like a key talking point this election? I don't know if I saw it right, but like a lot of black men actually swayed towards the Republican Party. Like, I don't know if I saw it, it was one in five or one in 10, but it was like a really, I, I think, I think Trump, about what it had been. Yeah, I think Trump gained a couple points with them. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I mean, normally it would be about 12% perhaps might go Republican, but Trump does better. Trump actually does better. Um, they, they, of course, there are various theories, right? Um, for example, uh, liberals w- would say that, well, there are some black men who are more patriarchal, right? Uh, maybe they do believe that, that uh, men should have a, an elevated place in society. And, and there's a theory that among uh, Latinx, among, I should say among Latinos, right? Among uh, Latino men right, that, that uh, there's, an, there's an idea of machismo, right, and the idea of, uh, of men being strong. Um, I don't know if that's specifically a thing with the Cuban American community, for example. Um, uh, the film Scarface kind of, <laughs> kind of uh, uh, put that on the big screen. But, uh, but the idea of patriarchy, machismo, uh, uh, there are some liberal theories that revolve around those ideas, right? Yeah, no, def- de- definitely. I can, and I can, like, answer that from from experience since i am like i am uh hispanic um and you talked about that machismo and and what i've found and what really surprised me is like with i think maybe unconsciously a lot of the of the actual latino demographic is a bit more like in ideology a bit more right-leaning like in that sense that you just mentioned, like the machismo and, and and in general, maybe a bit more. But since Trump has been so polarizing um, with some of the comments he's made regarding um, Latinos and immigrants and, and all that stuff, I think that that really has pushed them to like be more of a, of the left, like be more of the left's um, demographic but that's just from my experience like from what i've witnessed i found that even though most latinos will be like oh i'm i would vote democrat in in like i think they would mirror more of a conservative upbringing um but that's just my opinion well well, yes i mean many latinos grew up catholic and and certainly there are conservative aspects of the catholic faith of course joe biden himself is catholic uh, so I, I think I think that Catholicism may play some part in that. Part of it is cultural, right? Um, but yeah, but yeah, again, that's part of the uh, the Democratic autopsy in Florida, wondering why Miami Dade went from you know uh, what thirty points for Hillary Clinton down to what plus nine for, for Joe Biden. So there's there's real curiosity as to how that happened. So I think we're going to get a lot of reports, right? Because that was one of the most interesting. Uh, certainly one of the most interesting early stories from election night, what happened with Latino vote in Florida. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that was, that was surprising to say the least. Oh yeah. Very surprising. Right. That's why, uh, well, I mean, there are lots of reasons why Joe Biden lost Florida. Um, uh, For example, uh, on MSNBC, uh, uh, Jay Johnson, who's, or Jason Johnson, Jason Johnson, uh, who's a uh, commentator, he's African American, but he, he made the comment, you know, it, it's unfair to uh, blame Latinos for Trump's victory because Jason Johnson was for Biden. It's unfair to blame Latinos. Remember, lots of white people out there, right? I mean, <laughs> really, white people uh, are, are the key supporters for Donald Trump, and, and white voters are the key reasons, uh, are the key reason why uh, Donald Trump is so successful, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of reports and a lot of different uh, angles on, uh, uh, again, the Latino vote in Florida. We're going to see a lot of articles about that. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, no, the, uh, and I saw the, I believe it was like one of the key, one of the chief editors for the 1619 Project. So huh? she was she was preparing like something about a piece on like what happened with the Cuban Americans or, or that demographic of, of, of Florida. Well, well, the thinking is that um, many of these Cuban American families uh, are refugees from Castro's Cuba, right? And Fidel Castro was a notorious communist, and, and so the the vast majority 
of, of Cuban Americans who come to America tend to be staunchly anti-communist. So that's why when, when uh, the Republicans call Biden a socialist, hinting at communist, that really strikes a chord with, uh, with uh, Cuban American families. Um, there was a thinking that, that younger Cuban Americans would, uh, uh, would drift away. And I think Obama did much better with them when he was running. But I think, I think that socialist label, um, and also uh, the fact that Donald Trump is such a uniquely, uh, at, at least, at least um, pretends to be a macho individual, or he, he tries to come off as a macho individual, uh, I think that was appealing. I think that did have its appeal. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, but didn't didn't the macho appeal didn't that appeal like appealed to the bourbon white woman last election? Because that's what they found, right? That he lost a lot of ground on oh, white suburban woman. Right? You know, actually I was looking at some exit polling on that. Uh, actually not as much as you might have thought. Um, in fact, it was kind of a wash, actually. Suburban women didn't shift as much as you might think. Um, but yeah, I think I remember that. Uh, I, I, I think women, women still voted for him. If I remember correctly, Trump still won among white women. White women. I think white women still voted for Trump. Uh, uh, the women's vote overall voted against him. But because, because non-white women, like black women especially, they, they were really, really anti-Trump. Right, but I think white women still voted for Trump. Yeah, and and that when I, when I was watching the the first presidential debate, I remember because I was watching it with my with my mother, and I saw like how like how Trump's strategy could have been like so so like um, polarizing with the with the actual suburban woman. Um, seeing in my own house how how my parents were like kind of like shocked with like his tactic of like interrupting biden to see if he like stumbled a bit or, or oh, yeah. whatever his tactic might have been <laughs> that day and i thought that would have pushed a lot of that suburban woman vote because of like how the image he gave off that day but i don't think it moved it a lot yeah yeah from uh, that day I mean. And, that's, and I'm sure there are going to be some articles on that, because I'm sure a lot of women are wondering about that, right? I, I know that, that many uh, uh, female uh, liberal commentators, especially white female liberal commentators, were wondering, so what happened with white women? Why couldn't you support Hillary Clinton, right? Uh, in fact, many of them supported Barack Obama. Uh, you know, how, you know um, you, it's like uh, many voters were able to support Barack Obama, but they couldn't vote for Hillary Clinton. And a lot of uh, white liberal commentators were wondering, so how come white women won't vote for a white woman? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I I wasn't really like um, I wasn't really following in t following politi politics in 2016, but but like most of the criticism I've heard of Hillary Clinton was she, that she wasn't likable. But I never like understood what that point of view was that she was like she wasn't really likable or whatever. Oh, and that, that goes to a whole discussion about women in politics, right? And, and, and the double standard about how uh, men are allowed to get away with doing or saying things that women aren't allowed to or they're, they're looked down on for. Uh, and I know that, that uh, uh, before, in and after 2016, I know that uh, several, many, many articles have been written about that, the double standard, right? <laughs> Yeah, no, and and I remember watching. I think it was the Democratic primaries when, I think those accusations of, of Hillary like saying that Bernie Sanders was like sexist or whatever. I don't know if you remember that that Bernie Sanders had like said that uh, allegedly said that Hillary Clinton that he thought Hillary Clinton couldn't win because she was a woman or whatever. I think I think that was Elizabeth Warren. Oh, that was Elizabeth Warren. Oh, yeah, yeah, Eliz yeah. yeah. And I think, yeah, I, I think Bernie Sanders may have expressed what uh, many Democrats thought, which was that that because of Hillary Clinton's experience in 2016, it, it may not be politically practical to run a woman in 2020. And um, so I don't, I don't know exactly what happened. I mean, a lot of people do feel and think that way, uh, and maybe Bernie did mention it. And uh, but I don't know. I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I I was just surprised since she did win the popular vote that that 
since Hillary did win the popular vote, that that Bernie would supposedly say something like that. Um, that I was just surprised by that. I remember. Yeah. Well, of course, Hillary Clinton was a strong candidate in many ways. Uh, but but here's the thing. I mean, you know, so so Hillary just fell short, right? In Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania. Joe Biden is just getting over the hump. He's just making it in Wisconsin. Uh, Michigan uh, is widening up a bit. So Michigan, Michigan's not going to be all that close. It's, it'll be somewhat close, but Michigan won't be all that close. Um, Pennsylvania may be close. So either way, these states turn out to be tough because Trump has such a, a strong has such a strong base, right? He has such strong supporters, uh, even in states that uh, may eventually go blue. But, uh, but that, that's one thing that, uh, that Donald Trump clearly has, very committed supporters will come out and vote. That's very clear. Yeah, and that's actually part of the Trafalgar or Trafalgar poll. I think I was like reading into like how they did their polls and whatever. And I think part of it was like voter enthusiasm. Uh -huh. And that's part of why they had, and the, other than the fact that I think the, the key, the chief or I don't know what they what he's called, but I think he's also a Trump supporter. So, yeah, I, I think you're right. Yeah, is that is, is that the USC Trafalgar? I, I hear Trafalgar associated with USC. I can I can look him up, but uh, it's like um, no, um, I don't know if you mean his name, but the the poll the polar is like Trafalgar Group. That's the name of the Trafalgar Group, right? And sometimes they partner with USC. I think. Uh, the USC Trafalgar Group polls. But again, uh, uh, um, Nate Silver and others have derided them because actually they were far off on the popular vote because Hillary Clinton did win the popular vote by 2 to 3%. Um, and uh, uh, that Trafalgar poll said that she would lose the popular vote. So in many ways, they were far off, actually. Uh, but they were lucky in saying that, there, that it would be a Trump win, and Trump did pick the lock on those three key states. But I, I don't know if I misread the headline this, like, yesterday or today. I don't know. I think it was a CNN headline that said, like, that Trafalgar was once again, like, the, the most act one of the most or the most accurate, like, polars. But maybe not right now since, like, what's taking place. But, like, a couple of days ago, like, yesterday or today, I think. I think it was a CNN because I also think they, they like do it for the mayors and for the for the house and whatever. And I think I think they were fairly accurate according to a report, but but I may be like completely misquoting that. Well, you know, the vote still has to come in, right? Uh, yeah. and in some cases it may help Democrats, in other cases it may help Republicans. So yeah, let's wait until all the votes are in, basically. And then um, so as we saw from yesterday, you, you know, you, you can't it, it, it's risky to make a characterization too early. Yeah, no, definitely. Trump definitely spoke too early. Oh, I, I, I mean, everyone's expectations, right? The Democrats were expecting, you know, big Biden landslide, pick up the Senate, uh, gain seats in the House. And actually, the Democrats uh, suffered in the House and uh, lost, lost some seats and uh, won't take the Senate majority. So, so, de so Democratic expectations were dashed and Trump got overcome. Well, Trump, you know, made his statement, right? That, uh, oh yeah, he's, he's basically declaring victory. And then it, and then you get that, uh, that uh, uh, red mirage turning blue, right? In, in those three states, especially. And uh, that's where we are. And we'll, and by the end of the week, basically uh, we'll, we'll see how litigious this gets, you know, how much uh, yeah. law gets involved. <laughs> I saw Rudy Giuliani was like, already sewing, sewing like Pennsylvania or whatever. Yeah. So I think it's going to be a, a long race though. Oh yeah. Especially Pennsylvania, who knows what's going to, how long that's going to take. I, I heard uh, there's an MSNBC report that said that, um, that they're going to try to get the, the vast majority of the vote out by tomorrow. So um, if, especially if Biden overtakes the lead, right? Uh, and I was up late last night to see, or early this morning to see Wisconsin and Michigan, to see Biden take the lead in Wisconsin and then Michigan. And then we'll see if Biden takes the lead in Pennsylvania. And if the votes keep going that way, then uh, maybe maybe the the, uh, the networks will make a projection by Thursday or Friday. I thought it was really interesting that Fox News projected Arizona early, and that really irritated Trump. Uh, in fact, there were reports that said that 
One reason why Trump was so strident in his speech was because he was so irritated by the Fox News call of Arizona. Yeah, I was surprised by that too, because like the New York Times, another, because I was watching the New York Times, like electoral map or whatever it's called. And, I, right, they, and they were like really hesitant on calling it. And, and, and Fox was like really quick to call it. So that was, so that yeah, was quite and, uh, uh, you know, I, I saw Chuck Todd on NBC Nightly News tonight, and he was saying, you know, there's so many vote, there's so many votes out there, right? It's, it's like six hundred thousand votes. But then, based on what I know now, uh, now, granted, I'm, I'm I, I am quoting something on Twitter, which is very very risky. But but my under, my understanding is that uh, well, Steve Kornacki talked about how um, uh, the, 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 that the um, the first batch of of Maricopa vote that came in at five p.m or 6 p.m., 5 or 6 p.m., that that was 59% Trump. But I just read on Twitter that uh, actually after that, it's going to be a more Democratic dump. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because, who knows? Because I also saw like a couple of videos that, and I saw like like one of the Trump advisors was like doing the math on a whiteboard, and he, and he seemed like super confident about pulling off the win in Arizona. But then you have all like these news channels, like mainstream by saying that it's not that likely, so <laughs> so I don't know. I right. don't even know what to think of. It, yeah, how much wishful thinking is there? Yeah, but but based on uh, Kornacki's breakdown in Maricopa County, there were okay. So basically, there was the um, the early the early vote, the real early vote, and the then the same day vote, and then the late early vote. The the you know the the absentee ballots that just got in or they got driven in. Uh, the first batch that came out at five or six p.m. tonight. That was actually pro-Trump, 59%. But uh, again, I, I read on Twitter, and I, I can't vouch for the source though, but, but I, I hate saying that, I read on Twitter. But there's a rumor that actually the ballots afterwards will be more democratic. But again, you gotta be careful about quoting Twitter. Generally speaking, don't do it. <laughs> yeah, no, I barely, I recently got into Twitter. I, I haven't really used that for political news. I mostly relied on, on YouTuber. For everything but i think i read it. i'm trying to see what because I, I saw from cnn that they were projecting not projecting but they were expecting a second batch like yes, around uh, it's going to come in 1 a.m i don't know if it's easter I, I assume it's eastern but it could be uh, uh, uh mountain time which is arizona but uh yeah kornacki was saying that at 1 a.m again I, I don't know what time zone um actually it could be now if if uh uh, if, if if the 1 a.m. is Eastern time zone, that's 10 p.m. now. They might have a second batch up now. Yeah, I haven't I haven't seen any updates on the New York Times one. Hmm. They also haven't updated it a lot. Oh, yeah, it's the same. It's a difference of 2.1 points still. Yeah, there's a lot to sift through. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that, that was a bit, that, it was a nice talk. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I enjoyed talking with you. And uh, yeah, by all means, feel free to stick around afterwards. Um, uh, yeah, I, I always enjoy communicating with students after class, whether it's about the statistics class, the material, or just talking about anything really, right? But uh, um, yeah, I didn't mind having this recorded because I think we, have, we had a good discussion about politics. It was like a podcast. It felt like a podcast, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah we were just kind of gabbing about, first of all, uh, you know, uh, in, in a way, student skills about uh, various intelligences you might want to look into, and then delving into uh, uh, the electoral politics of the week. So th this was a really good optional sections for students just to learn more about life and politics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I enjoyed my podcast with you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, same. All right. Okay. Well, you have a good night, and let's let's talk more uh, later in the course. Yeah, definitely. We'll be checking in more. Okay. And remember, it's Emilio. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm just kind of busy these these weeks, but but I'm going to start checking in more after. Okay. Good. All right. Good. Good. Okay. Yeah. I look forward to hearing from you. Yeah. No. Have a good night. Uh, good night. Yes. Take care.